Hello, I'm the Glove Street Lodger. I've just come back from work. It's a stunningly beautiful day out there. The sky is so blue, the trees are so green, and the grass. It's more beautiful than the summer, really, because that has that washed out feeling, but this is vibrant. It's just gorgeous. Um, and I'm going to talk about what I have read in May. Here goes, not May. April, as I say, I'm just back from work. Got a bit of a headache as well. Anyway, what did I read in April? Oh, I didn't start with that. God, I started with this. Uh, the Metamorphosis of Ovid by David R. Slavitt. Now, David R. Slavitt wrote the translation of Ariosto's Orlando Furioso that I read a few years ago now and really enjoyed. And he has a very loose translating style. He's all about the fun uh, and the emotion and... Uh, less about strict textual accuracy. So it was a very loose, baggy uh, translation of uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis. Though, to be honest, I wouldn't know a strict, tight translation if I saw one either. I've never read Ovid's Metamorphosis. I now have three versions, so I can, over the years, uh, compare them. In fact, one of them is really interesting because it's different people translating different sections. But anyway, I, I love this. This was really good. Um, Slavitz keeps it fun and interesting. And it's such an odd little idea because Ovid's basically saying, I want to write an epic, you know. The Aeneid's done brilliantly for this guy. I want my own. But I'm just not that kind of a writer. I'm a very sort of small-scale domestic domestic -y kind of writer. What do I do? Ah, I get a theme, in this case, change and metamorphosis. And I retell it. And while I'm doing it, I'll tell the whole history of the world as we we Romans see it. So it goes from the creation of the earth to uh, the creation of the Roman Empire under Augustus uh, via change. And it's really interesting. So the beginning had some very, uh, very interesting parallels to the Bible. The sort of creation myth in this is that you've got the four elements, earth, wind, fire and uh, funk. And they, they have different weights. Funk is, of course, heavy. Uh, and, and the different weights separate out. So the element, so essentially the, the universe is created by elemental uh, weight, which in some ways you could say it is, which I found interesting. They had their own flood myth in this uh, with a guy called Duokalon. Uh, his reaction when he got to land was to cry and mourn and be extremely uh, upset about all the people that died. Uh, Noah's was, of course, to get pissed and sleep naked. Um, and and the descriptions of the flood with uh, Zeus wringing the water out the clouds and the rivulets falling down his beard and hair and the, the, the porpoises playing like birds above forests and things like this. It's really good. Um, one of the fun games is where you get a character's name and you think, I wonder what they might turn into. So there's Lycon, who turns into a wolf, and that's really visceral. It's, it's, it's almost American werewolf in London. Uh, there's Cygnus. He puffs up and turns into a swan, of course. Uh, Narcissus turns into some Narcissi. Loads of people turn into plants. I mean, the last thing you want to be in the ancient classical mythical world is a dryad or a woman, because everyone's chasing you and trying to rape you. Uh, and you often get turned into a plant. And sometimes even when you turn into a plant, that doesn't stop people fondling you. Yeah, so it all built to this point, and the point at the end was essentially that, that you know, as, as solid as the world feels, change, abrupt change, is sort of how it works. The world is full of wonder, and we, we forget that in our daily lives, but it's there, and, uh, and, and the world is always changing, and people are always changing, and, and we have to enjoy it, and, and ride it, and have fun with it, and... and both Ovid and, and Slavit in combo have a great deal of fun with that. And I, I really enjoyed the book. The next book is one I really want to get hold of for quite a while. My mum bought it for me for Easter, which was lovely. This is called This Is How You Lose the Time War. And it is by Amal El Mokhtar and Max Gladstone. And uh, uh, I came to ask about face. So when I was doing my old Naomi Mitchison's last year, I read one called Travel Light. And loads of people were saying, ah... Oh, I came to this book through How We Lose the Time War. So I thought, oh, I wonder what that book is that's recommending this book. So I came through How to Lose the Time War through Travel Light. It's about these two possible future factions. There's the Garden, which is a sort of bio, um, 
sort of plant-based future. And then there's the agency, which is a sort of technological um, implants-based future. And they're both possible futures for a post-human race. Um, and they both have time travel. And so they both go up and down timelines and, and create branching timelines and alternate timelines and all sorts to try and ensure that their future is the one that happens. But because they can both do this, they can undo each other and we do each other. It's like a constant 4D chess in which no one is going to win. Indeed, no one's going to lose. So the title is How to Lose a Time War. Uh, and the main two characters are called Blue and Red and they are agents on the opposite side. And they start by taunting each other across the battlefield. They're both regarded as unusual in their societies uh, and unusually good at their job of mucking up timelines. And, and they start to fall in love through this weird long-distance communication. And it turns out their connection uh, goes very far back and indeed very far forwards. Um, and I enjoyed it. I really did. I preferred the situation. I liked the idea of the time war. And amount of times we've heard of time wars in, in Doctor Who or the time war. And I never really got much of a glimpse of what that could be except um, John Hurt writing on a wall, really. And, and so this is a time war in which you're going about altering time to make your outcome the outcome that's supposed to happen. Uh, and as such, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. I really loved it. Um, but the love story, that was a bit, it was a little overwritten and I didn't quite believe it. And to be honest, I was just interested in the time war stuff. Oh, well. So the next book I read was <clears throat> very condensed title of sketches of some booksellers of the time of dr johnson by e marston and it's literally that it's some sketches of some booked out sellers at the time of dr johnson uh, starting of course with michael johnson uh samuel's dad uh, and and it does a good job of explaining you know michael johnson's role as a uh, a provincial bookseller all the ways in which he had to branch out and innovate and his when he bit off more than he could chew buying uh, Lord Darby's library of 2,900 books, which incidentally is about the amount of books I'm currently boxing and shipping. So I've got my own little Lord Darby library here. Um, and, and interestingly, it was written the year after the birthplace became a museum. So it's all about this exciting future of a Dr. Johnson museum. This was before the one in Goth Square. And then it goes through a whole bunch of other booksellers and tells anecdotes about them. And if you're into 18th century book selling and booksellers, it's really interesting. I really loved it. It was a bit about Edward Cave and where he came from and sort of the misadventures he had before. Uh, there's the bookseller whose name I can never remember that Johnson beat up with a volume uh, for being rude to him. And it even names the volume that he beat him up with. Um, yeah, it's 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 fun. It's yeah, if now I'm gonna write about it obviously on my blog, and it's uh a cheeky little funny book. I like cheeky little funny books. Uh, the next thing I read was a little bit more peculiar. It's called uh, A Little Pilgrim Peeps at Parnassus. By, uh, it says, illustrated by Arthur Watts. I looked up who wrote it and then I didn't write it down. Uh, <laughs> but it's, the illustrations are very good. And it looked like a children's book where it's sort of the history of British uh, poetry uh, and they, they peep, the peeps at Parnassus and talk about the status of British poetry from the Druids to the modern day of 1920-something? 27. Uh, and the numbers I'm reading it and it's Sarkia and Sarkia and Sarkia and I'm like, oh, this, this isn't a children's book. <laughs> this isn't a children's book at all. This is a... Uh, an adult piss take that's pretending to be a children's book. As such, it's very interesting. Um, uh, the, the the rhymes are a bit too tight. It, it gets a bit da 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 at times. But that doesn't really matter because it's it's just taking the miss. Really. Taking the miss. Well, that sounds a lot nicer. Taking the piss. Uh, it describes the 18th century as an age of... Uh, a good mind and bad heart, which I quite liked. Uh, it talks about Johnson being a firm, sort of someone who's trying to hold back the chaos of language. 
it's it's fun. It's fun. I'm going to write about that too. Too. Uh, next thing I read was um, this one here. It's another Johnsonian gleanings. The last one I read was number three, which was Johnson's boyhood life. And this is Johnson's early life, but the final narrative. So there are 12 of these, but the last two are an index. So essentially, this is his summary of everything he's discovered in the previous nine volumes. And it's a very detailed account of Johnson's life up to um, about 40 and it's it covers a lot of the stuff I've been reading, but hey, the more you read it, the more it gets in your head, and the more you can then start shaping it and thinking about it from a novel. Uh, I've got some really good ideas for that, and it's really exciting. Uh, and and he lets go a bit more in this old Lyle read. He because uh, it's his summary. He doesn't need to prove everything he's saying because he can just go look, read the previous nine bloody volumes if you want some proof. So he can have a bit more fun and be a little bit more. Uh, opinionated and just say what he's thinking about things and, and tell it a bit more of a story. So I like that element of it and I enjoyed the book. And also his introduction is great where he's essentially saying, yeah, I've almost accidentally dedicated my life to this project. I was just doing a bit of family genealogy and then whoosh, all this Johnson stuff came up. Uh, and, and now I've been writing it for 20 odd years and uh, funding it myself and paying for the, for the volumes and two world wars have come in between that. Uh, one of which he, he fought in World War I um, in France. And uh, World War Two, he was involved um, you know, on the home front. And, and so he's like, after those very rude inter uh, interruptions, I kept going. And then there we get that. And it's a nice little send-off to him. And a nice re-reminder of all these things. And then there's still a few little odd bits and pieces that come up. And make me go, oh, I didn't realise that. Or I don't remember that. That I'm writing down, uh, and and it's all it's all grist for the mill, whatever grist is. Uh, want some grist? Sounds tasty. Okay, so next book I read. I'm not totally sure I'm getting this in the right order, but it doesn't really matter, does it? Muriel Spark, The Girls of Slender Means. Now I have uh, an interesting relationship with Muriel. Sometimes I love her, sometimes I hate her, but She's always interesting, even when I'm not enjoying the book. And she's always herself. Like, you pick up a Muriel Spark book, and it's very definitely a Muriel Spark book. And that's that's good. I like that in a writer. She has a really good way of first lines on the whole. This one's a great one. Long ago in 1945, all the nice people in England were poor, allowing for exceptions. Uh, the streets of the cities were lined with buildings in bad repair or in no repair at all. It goes on. It says those buildings look like rotten teeth in a nice jaw. And then there's the really sad point that the Albert Memorial had not been hit, not even shaken by any bomb from first to last. And then near the Albert Memorial, there's a club called the May of Tech Club, which is wonderfully awkwardly named. And the May of Tech Club exists to provide housing, shelter, uh, and um, social life for girls of slender means. So essentially women who've come to London to work and, and can't live there. And so it's one of her ensemble novels, essentially a group of girls who all live in this place uh, just after the war. And uh, you know now they have to readjust to their peace selves. Uh, they're, they're, they're poor, they're of slender means. They have one really nice dress they share between them. And I love all the different characters there's one who pretends she's dating an actor and she just goes out and, and goes round and round the park again and again while she's on these dates uh, there's no one who has this wonderful 1920s way of talking and she's like oh that's horrific um was it oh i am filfington anyone got the soapy joe which if you met someone who talked like that would be really annoying but it's quite funny in the book and then there's this other woman who does brain work and brain work, it turns out, is writing sob letters to writers. So they return, they reply to her and she can sell their autographs. Anyway, this whole collection of people uh, live in the, the, the wonderfully named uh, Mary of Tech Club, um, where there's brown wallpaper, a very narrow window out onto the, the roof that only some people can squeeze out of, and uh, a secret in the back garden. And it's, it's a very good book, uh, very enjoyable, very short. 
and and very easy to follow uh which sometimes she can be a bit f hard to follow on muriel uh but yeah oh muriel like i know her miss spark mrs spark i don't know muriel spark she's great she's really good but yeah it's a good book uh next was another sort of returning favorite naomi mitchison one of her last books indeed i think it's a twin volume with sea green ribbons which i haven't got and sea green ribbons and this i think are her last books and it's called the oath takers and it's set in France. Uh, Charlemagne has just died. Our main character is called Drogo. Um, but not Carl Drogo. And he is uh, a Frank. And he he has this sort of dual heritage represented by the two languages he speaks. So he speaks Frankish, which is the heritage of his pagan ancestors, their toughness, their roughness, their readiness to fight. But also he speaks what he calls the noble language, Latin, his connection to Christianity and philosophy and gentleness. And he sees in himself those two things coming together as him being you know, a bulwark, uh, protecting Christianity against all of its enemies. Uh, and they have to go and take an oath, he and his dad. And the problem with this is, one, oaths are taken very, very seriously. And two, they're giving an oath to the king, but they're doing it through the Count of Paris. And they're worried, what if the Count of Paris goes against the king? Who is the oath to? Is it to the Count of Paris? In that case, they've they've told God they're going to follow him. Or is it to the king? And that's that's sort of a, one of the dilemmas. Uh, another is, he, you know, he becomes a young man and he gets a horse and a sword and goes around being a twat and hurting people. Uh, and being oathless, not being tied to anyone. And then he, this woman gives him an oath to go to Moorish Spain to deliver a letter. And in so doing, he discovers the, um, the huge cultural wealth of Moorish Spain. And indeed, how that cultural wealth is is strengthened by its, its welcoming nature, or relatively welcoming nature. Uh, and so he comes back uh, a new man. Oh, look, he's come of age at the end. <laughs> it's very, very abrupt. Uh She's, she's a writer who writes with her head. And so it, you don't get much of the feelings except that she's worked out what the feeling should be. You don't get this feeling that she connects in that way. She just thinks about things. Um, and I think she's writing for a younger audience because it, it seems a little bit sparser than some of her other stuff. Not just because it's thinner, but the writing itself is, is not as dense. It starts with a really interesting um, essay about writing historical novels. So that was fun. And all about how you find your place and you find sort of the walls that you're going to do, the, the things you can't change or feel you can't change, but then you add something new and see what happens. And that's that's interesting. And that's what I'm doing for my historical novel that I'm writing. So that came about at a nice time. Cool. Next thing I read, I read a lot. Uh, Patience Agbabi, The Time Thief. And this is a very rare thing. This... It's a library book. I've borrowed this book. And I'm glad I borrowed it because I didn't like it very much. <laughs> the reason I borrowed it was because it's a second in a series of books about uh, what they're called leapers. They can jump forward and backwards in time. Um, I'm guessing from this one that the first one was set forwards in time and this one set backwards in time. It's set in 1752. Uh, and they visit Samuel Johnson. And Francis Barber is one of the main characters. And so that's why I wanted to read it, because I, I like a good fictional depiction of, uh, of Samuel Johnson. I'm going to write another one soon. So, But also just I enjoy it. I enjoy how writers approach this challenge. And to be honest, Patience Agbabi approaches this challenge really well. Her Samuel Johnson, she doesn't do the, the lazy thing where she just writes um, Johnson quotes. <laughs> you know, Johnson is always speaking in quotes from Boswell. She doesn't do that. Which is really, really good. Um, when I write mine, there will be certain phrases that he'll use again and again because I feel that he favoured certain phrases. Like, you know, um, I've completely forgotten any of them. <laughs> but, but there are. Um, uh, yeah, so she doesn't She doesn't often make Johnson quote himself. He he. She's, she's come up with sort of her own characterisation of him. He's rough around the edges, but he's very kind and he's very open. And he, the children read poetry to him, but it's like rap and new poetry. But he's really open to it because he just likes the play of words and things. Whereas, the, yeah, the real Johnson probably, that's not correct. <laughs> but, but still, it's fun. It's, you know, 
is a a thought out and presented Johnson has just done pretty well. Uh, though I think she's mainly picked Johnson one because of his connection to Francis Barber and she she likes him, but also because of Johnson's possible Tourette's. Uh, and at one point she says that his powers come from the same place as his weaknesses. And I, not necessarily, you know. I don't think Tourette's is his superpower. Uh, if he had it, then then it might have, it would have affected how he thought and the way he saw the world and stuff. But many other things affected him as well. So yeah. Anyway, what I don't like about it, and this sounds terrible, is is <laughs> this is going to make me sound so bad. I know I look like a gammon, but I'm not really. Uh, the diversity, um, and it's because it's not diverse. <laughs> So the leaplings, the people who can jump back and forth in time, are born on leap years. But only a very select number, I think it's 0.06% of all people born then, can do it. And so all the leaplings we meet, we meet six. Four of them have autism and one of them has ADHD. So maybe there's a thing in the first book about how people with autism um, have, you know, are more likely to have this maybe but it does mean that the autism comes up all the time she's always saying oh well i'm an autistic as an autistic oh no there were some bright colors and that affected my autism um at one point the two main characters almost don't go and save their friend because they're worried about itchy labels in the back of the disguise they have to wear uh she's a character who freaks out no she doesn't forget she shuts down if she's offered food that's not white and she's travelling to 1752. If non-white food is too much for you, 1752 is going to be too much for you. Um, and it, you know, everything always boils back down to it's all about just autism all the time. <laughs> like it stops the it stops the adventure some of the times because oh no, I've got autism and and the play of light has distracted me and I'm just watching the lights now um, instead of carrying on the adventure uh, there's one bit and 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 she refers everything back to her autism so so she there's anna williams who lived in in the you know goth square um with johnson who was blind or near blind at this point and she says oh i, I bet that makes life difficult for her being near blind just as my autism makes it difficult for me and i'm like yeah we're on page 94 you've told us every other page we kind of know this by now and it's just really stiffly written as well like really 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 stiffly written uh i'm trying to find oh, there's loads of it but um i can't think like big ben i can only think like me i love words the sight the sound and the feel of them mc squared likes words too but he's more into the sound that's why he's an mc and yesterday he didn't sound like himself when he said francis I imagine how he would normally say it. And it's just, I don't know, just really, really stiff. Um, they'll say things like, we need to have an alibi. An alibi means it is somewhere where you have to be uh, to prove that you did not do a thing. And things like that. I don't know. I didn't enjoy it. The next book was one I enjoyed far more than I expected. It is... The History of the Litchfield Conduit Lands Trust by Percy Lathwaite. It's it's literally that. It's a history of um, of of the Litchfield Conduit Lands Trust. So, Litchfield had um, so in just after in the reign of Edward the Seventh, just after Henry the Eighth, uh, a man left a bunch of lands to a charity saying. Sort, use these lands, they've got lots of springs on them, sort the water out for Litchfield and charge for it and sort it out and any money you make, put into a charity to benefit the town. And that's exactly what they did. And so this is all about how, one, the water stuff was sorted out and two, all the charitable things they did with the money. And that's it really. Uh, it tells you a lot about how Litchfield worked and how Litchfield has worked. Um, now, the the trust still exists but they're, they're part of the normal water system so they get sewage water like the rest of us now but for a long time they had the cleanest and cheapest water in the area they had um, very few fires in Litchfield because of this good water access they also 
people squirts fire engines that all had different names and they'd celebrate on celebrational days by squirting them around and uh, it'd be part of the parade uh, because they had them and other people didn't um, and the, the land also sort of paved the place uh, set up the, the run the well help finance the grammar school which gave the world you know Addison and Garrick and Johnson and all these other people uh, uh, it it sent it, it gave scarf to Johnson's gran and it sent Johnson's dad on his apprenticeship so it's just for the Johnson stuff it really affected their lives and weirdly this book's hilarious partly because it's, it's got all sorts of odd little stories so they made uh, in Victorian times they built this big clock uh, tower and they bought a clock the clock wasn't as good as the one they thought it would be it ran needed winding up every fifth day rather than every eighth day so they then had to pay the person who kept the clock more money because he had to wind it up more often but it wasn't very well made, so it kept slipping time. So he had to keep going to the train station to get the time to, <laughs> to set up the town clock and stuff like that. It's very funny. And also, whenever the book wants to slag off a town as being very badly run, it picks Coventry, which I love. And then the last book I read this month is The Crock of Gold by James Stevens. This is a weird book. A very good first line. In the centre of the pine woods called Quila de Raca, there lived not too long ago two philosophers. So these two philosophers meet and marry two she uh, fairies um, and have two children. <laughs> and they can't remember whose child is whose. And then one of the philosophers and one of the fairies kill themselves. And so now we've got this family of four. And the philosopher upsets a bunch of leprechauns because he helps a man get his washboard back. But he doesn't get his washboard back. He finds the leprechaun's gold and the leprechaun's blame the philosopher for it um and and, and they, they frame him for murder so that there's a great bit with policemen interrogating leprechauns uh, at the same time the greek god pan has had a son to have a little wandering island and has abducted the daughter of their next door neighbor who wanders off with pan before the, the Celtic god of love, um, I want to call him Brian Og, he's not called Brian, Angus Og, uh, basically has a love off with Pan and wins, and wins her love. Uh, and then at the end, the, the, the philosopher's in prison, his wife and kids have gone to Angus Og to get help, and Angus Og wants to celebrate his, his wedding. And he and all the she and the gods and the fairy folk and everyone come down into the real world and it's it's almost like a joyful apocalypse um and you could definitely read also you know some irish nationalism in there you know all the irish folktales rising up against things like the rule of law which of course is you know english law um and, and policemen who are serving english interests and things but at the same time you could also see it as you know the fantastical and the joyful and the the, the spirit felt against the mundane and the everyday. There's also a lot of uh, slightly, slightly dated, very dated uh, battle of the sexes stuff. So women are represented as being all emotion and men as all, all logic. And one day there's going to be this wonderful joining between logic and emotion, but it's never happened yet. Um, and in fact, that is the marriage of Angus Og uh, and, and the beautiful woman, except Angus Hogg isn't much of a thinker, so it doesn't quite work on that front. But hey, but, but yeah, you could read it as these slightly stale and, and hard, yeah, iffy to read. Um, men are this, women are this kind of rhetoric, rhetoric. Or you could read it as, you know, the heart and the, you know, the man and woman are representing more than that. They're representing the heart and head. And um, true wisdom is a unification of the heart and the head coming together smashing up all the dull stuff in life it's really good and it's beautifully written and it's strange and it mixes fairy tales and myths and just sort of funny irish characters really so it's very good so yeah 10 books uh, this month uh, I, I didn't read any proust because i was a bit sick of him I'll, I'll pick some up again in a bit honest three uh, theatres theatre bits the first was called Deaf as a Post 
as you can see, written by Sean Blaney and directed by Emma Copland. Sean Blaney also played the main character. He was very, very likable as the main character. Very, um, yeah, very amenable. I liked him a lot. And he played this character who was deaf to high frequency sounds. He wasn't completely deaf, but over a certain frequency he couldn't hear at all, and at certain frequencies he couldn't hear very well. And he was um, introduced with him having a conversation, and his hearing aids were playing up. So when he couldn't hear her, she spoke fluid gibberish or nonsense or silliness. It was great. And this runs throughout. You know, We, as an audience, hear what he was hearing. Um, but it's not a, an issues play. I mean, it is because it's about him living with this kind of deafness and his self-worth and his self sense of self and you know, all this kind of stuff. But... <laughs> It's also during a kind of zombie apocalypse. So something happens, which means there are these people called loopers, who are people who repeat themselves all the time, like, uh, uh, the price is right, the price is right, the price is right. And they're essentially zombies who come and get you. And this has been set off by an audio weapon in BT Tower. And because he can't hear it, he is immune, uh, unlike many other people. So he's now like a superhero in this post-apocalypse. And it was a very good play. I very much enjoyed it. Good fun. The next thing I read was, I uh, read, I watched, was called Agat. There it is, Agat. Uh, it was all about um, a lady called Agat, who was the Prime Minister of Rwanda. And when the, the president was killed in a plane explosion, she became the president of Rwanda, but for less than 14 hours, because she was head of the sort of the kill list, essentially. And the first half was all about building up the tension and building, you know, explaining what's going on and introducing her. And then the plane explosion happens at the end of that. And then the last half, last you know, after the interval, was all about those tense 14 hours. And what I loved about it is she was brave and she was strong and she was clever and all of this stuff in the play and presumably in real life. Uh, but that didn't count for anything. <laughs> Because partly because she was a woman, and partly just because of the situation she was in, you can be as brave as you want, but when a whole bunch of people want to catch you and chop bits off you and put things up you, you're just gonna hide under a table, and that is what she did, and it didn't make her less brave or less impressive. It just made everything much grimmer. So yeah, a play about the Rwandan genocide of 1994. It's a safe place though. The government says so. Uh, also, they gave me things like they gave me this very nice little um, notepad. Yeah, a very pleasant little notepad there. Um, a little homemade wax candle owl. So thanks for that. I enjoyed the play anyway. You didn't need to bribe me. And then after that, or the day after that, actually, I saw the Fairy Queen, which was nearly three hours of 17th century Purcell court mask music, which sounds a bit much, but actually was really, really interesting. I love the direction of it. It was weirdly sexy for a lot of it. They were all uh, running around in, in very little, and what they were running around in was sort of slinky and cool, uh, singing songs of love at each other. I think songs like, um, I would give a thousand years of of uh, healthy days for one special night and you know, this kind of stuff and it was really good and the orchestra used a period it was a period orchestra so they had theorbos and big baroque trumpets and stuff and um, there was always something to look at it was this ensemble and and you had your favorites so i quite like the guy with the black paint here who occasionally wore wings um uh, the the guy who was the drunken poet he was really watchable there was this woman who sang this uh, plaintive uh, song about how she'll never love again and she and then there was this other guy who was just a bit of a goofball his facial expressions were good and you could watch the different members we could watch them all it was it was very very well done and it was uh, three hours of uh, old opera <laughs> not my natural thing but i really enjoyed it and and there we go now, I'm, I've only got a month left, and at the moment I've got two plays booked, and um, yeah, that's it so far. Uh, I've got lots to pack and lots to do, and 
I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Anyway, I want to go get a pot of tea because I've got a rather large headache. Yeah, pot of tea. Got some fish. Got some bread. Bit of, yeah, should be alright. Have a nice one. Bye-bye.